What I do want you to know about me is that I'm One second. What do you believe about yourself? I don't know. Nothing good. I've been called just about every name you can think of. Slut, dumb blonde. I've been called retarded throughout my life. I've been told that I'm going to be a failure. Tranny, a she-male, a faggot. Stupid, dumb. Dumb Blonde's probably one of the worst ones for me because I strive to get straight A's and I work hard so that people don't have that perception of me. Skids, I only got called that after coming to this school. I'm not what you would call a skid, but being in this school, people label me as that. Skids, that is a cultural thing and it's the culture that these kids are living in. It's their pure culture. My mom drove to come pick me up, and I got in, and she's like, wow, everyone in this school is like such skids. The way that this school is seen is it's like the last chance high school. If you fail here and you get asked to leave this school, then you aren't fit for another school in the Langley School District. It's the kids that didn't make it, the kids that are doing drugs or don't have a good home life. They're doing bad things. Our kids walk onto a bus, and the bus driver or the passengers on the bus react to them differently. The first thing that people think is, these are rejects. These are kids that can't cope. These are violent kids, gang kids, kids that aren't safe. I mean, we've heard it all. We get learning disabled, oppositional defiant disorder, intensive behavioral disorders. We get bad kids, troubled kids, at-risk kids, a kid who is lost. I could give you a thousand labels and none of them match. And this one, um, he'd be about nine months. It's tough to invite people into your story because you put yourself in a position of tremendous vulnerability. He was mischievous and full of life and energy and never cried. You run the risk of opening yourself up for judgment and you invite the world to look at what you may or may not have done well as a parent or you might have people judge your children and never in a million years did I think that we would be here like how do you get here nobody pictures this for their kid That first job I had as a teacher, I had an amazing principal of the school. I remember saying to that principal that very first year, what am I supposed to do? What's my goal? How do I do all that stuff? And I remember her saying to me, have them show up. If they can show up, that's your first part of your job. scary and we get that we know there's a whole bunch of students that are afraid to just come walk in the door because they're concerned about all the bodies in here and those that have anxiety stuff going on for you right now you feel it kind of raising we know it's scary a whole bunch of new people a new experience we we appreciate you for taking that step and walking through the door
When I first was asked to start a brand new alternate school, they knew in Langley that they just weren't engaging the kids. I mean, one in five kids wasn't graduating. We needed something in the district for kids um, as far as suspensions and drug use. And it wasn't helpful sending kids home on suspensions. It was giving them three days to five days to just be in the community unsupervised and make poor choices. That's your grandfather's? Yeah. What was his name? David. And so he liked Crown Royal. So I got the Crown Royal logo. Xanax is a really messed up drug. The stuff I did while I was high on that, that I don't even remember, is ridiculous. It's super addictive. I've smoked meth before and not have the urge to make the same decisions as I did when I was on Xanax. I obviously had a strong hatred towards school. I was living in a fucked up situation at the time. So, you know, I wouldn't go to school. And then I come to school after a week of just not being there. And they're like, get mad at me. And I'm like, well, first of all, like, I'm not showing up here for a reason. Second of all, you getting mad at me when I do show up isn't helping me come back. So I kind of dropped that whole public school thing. I was smoking weed a lot. I was skipping all of my classes. I would go to school two classes a day. I was drinking half or more of a two six at lunch and going to all my classes drunk. I was only in there for six weeks. And the principal and the other staff there told me that I was bringing down the reputation of their school. And he told me that I couldn't be at the school anymore. In my last school, when I was in grade nine, I was 15. I had a suicide attempt at school. And uh, I, I opened up a pencil sharpener and I took out the blade and I swallowed it. The reasons why they are externalizing behaviors or internalizing behaviors was one and the same. You know, they were traumatized. They had traumatic experience that somewhere along their way of development, whether it was early in their lives or later, their nervous systems changed. As I did the educational work around theory, realized that the link between education and therapy was a real clear one. So we built this school under the foundation of a trauma-sensitive environment, and that challenged us. That challenged us to really look at uh, what was our job. You know, is it just to put out all the new curriculum and teach the kids how to fulfill the graduation requirements for graduation, or, or was there more? Can we get this meeting started? Um, just a reminder, um, those of you who were away last week, um, with Somebody asked me what my job was once, and I said it was to inject hope. And I don't mean everybody needs my tattoo, but I have it. I can tell you that uh, school was my safe place as a kid. I grew up in a dysfunctional alcoholic home, and um, school was where my needs got met. So I always knew I was going to be a teacher. When you say a lot of these kids have gone through trauma, it just means they've gone through some really hard times that they didn't know how to deal with. And when you don't know how to deal with something, often you don't. When you don't deal with it, it you bring it with you other places. And so um, as, as a result, you're more reactive and you don't know why, you know? Uh, or you're more detached and you don't know why. The only way through the pain is through the pain. But you're not gonna go through it if you're not safe. For a lot of kids, school is not a safe place. People have become numb to the word safe, but I think it actually matters. For me, the kids that are here are here because they're not wanted at the other schools. Well, that, that says a lot almost right there as being an Aboriginal. You know, we weren't wanted at a lot of places. Back in my 20s, I was lost. You know, I didn't, didn't understand who I was, what my culture was, traditional teachings and stuff like that, because I was in a dark phase. You know, I wasn't on the red road. I was on the dark road. So I get them. These kids come here already damaged. You know, they come here with already these issues. And I can come across and say, look, people don't know you for you. They see you as being 
the outer shell of you. They don't get to know the real you. Misconceptions and stereotypes. I had always wanted to be in education. I wanted to be a teacher. That's what I went to university for the first time. And um, it just didn't work out. I almost went to law school, and I didn't, because I was raising the boys. I'm an education trustee, and I sit on the Board of Education for the Langley School District, which means that I'm a politician. Raising a child in the system, I just thought that running for the board would be a way to, you know, look at where the gaps are and try and, and do the things that I can at a local level. I remember the first time somebody said to me, Oh, well, we can't do that. And I said, well, why not? And they said, well, the system. They said, the system? Who's the system? You know, get the system on the phone for me. Charlie was a lovely child. He was bright. He was clever. He was this beautiful baby. Super smart, very social, very happy. They would test him and his intelligence would always come up fine. And they would say, well, there's no learning disability here. He's just basically bad. I noticed some behaviors in Charlie that as a mom, I found to be a little bit worrisome. All the while, Charlie's falling farther and farther and farther behind and school's becoming more traumatic for Charles. The child that they were describing to me at school wasn't the child that I was seeing at home. So I, you know, call all the numbers and everything is coming back. He's not bad enough. There's nothing wrong. He's, this is behavior. Just go home. I'm uh, really drunk. Yeah, it's tough when your kid goes sideways. He wasn't eating. He was using substances. He wasn't sleeping. Towards the end of his grade 10 year, I came home Mother's Day, and he had OD'd. And at first, it was treated like just a kid who, you know, wanted to get high. But as my family doctor started digging around, it was like, no, there's a lot of suicidal ideation here. This is actually him trying to commit suicide. There was no resources for him. We didn't qualify for anything because it wasn't seen as a problem. That summer, he left my home. I didn't hear from my son for about nine and a half weeks. When Charlie left my care, he was about 165 pounds. I got Charlie back six months later, basically in a pile of bile in my garage at about 125 pounds. There's this new thing happening. They were like seizures, but they were rage, just anger. And I thought, oh, we have a significant issue here. And he was so stressed out that he would rather die than deal with school. First of all, you guys, thanks for being here. Like, and I actually mean that. Like, I'm not just saying that. I know that you've all had tons of different experiences, either individually or together. So um, I thought, OK, how do I start a group like this? How do we start talking about real struggle? And I guess maybe how we start talking about real struggle is by looking at the empty chairs. One's on the run, and one's back in addiction, and that's really hard. I wish that Charles was here. Um, as a counselor, one of my biggest struggles is when you set all the things in place to help somebody go a certain direction, they take all the steps and then they end up where they were. Right? I get it, because those struggles sometimes come with shame and guilt, and you don't want to talk about them. 
when you're in them. That doesn't mean that we're gonna stop trying to help. We're still gonna help. So that being said, what kinds of struggles are you going through now or have you had to go through and still do school? Um, part of when I came to this school was that I didn't have any respect for myself or my body. So I did a lot of things with a lot of people that I didn't want to do just because you feel like it doesn't matter anymore. Not everyone here knows, but as somebody who's gone through sexual assault um, and who wasn't able to talk about it for years. I didn't even tell um, my dad. He only found out about it, I think, last year. Um, and that was only because I had started talking about it at school. And I had come to the realization that if I wanted to heal, I needed other people to help me. I, when, when people do that, I freeze up. Like, there's nothing I can do anyways. Like, yeah. there's, I couldn't have done it the first time. Why would I be able to change it this time? And it took me, I guess it's seven years now for me to actually start talking to about it with Mindy because I trust her. She understands on a level that nobody else did. We would never do this to a kid with a physical handicap. You know, if a kid was in a wheelchair, there's no ramp, we're gonna build it. And if we don't have a ramp, we're certainly not gonna get really mad at them if they go up the stairs slow. But with kids that have gone through emotional trauma in their lives, you know, there's no ramp. And then we get really pissed off at them that they're not very good at going up the stairs. How many kids believe that if there's an adult a trusted adult in your life and you're going through struggles, you can go to them? Not many. Yeah, not many. Yeah, she's she's a baby. She's 18 years old, this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do I do? <laughs> they, actually, my boss is asked that all the time. <laughs> Uh, I clean the school. I clean the school. I've worked here 20 years now. Um, I'm lucky enough uh, that I can bring my best friends to work. Um, my uh, two dogs are both rescue dogs. Uh, Livy here was severely abused. I got Livy uh, 18 years ago. Um, she was eight months old, and I took her out on trial, trial basis. Um, I told him I needed a dog that would stick close by me. And uh, whenever I touched her, she would just cringe. She was beat up by a, a male, apparently. And after a month, I couldn't bond with her. So I brought her back to the shelter, and I said, no, she's not working out. And uh, to my uh, chagrin, they uh, told me, well, she's a three-time loser. We'll, we'll have to put her down. Well, I grabbed my dog and I walked out. And she's been the best dog I've ever had. I have a saying that uh, to understand is to forgive. Uh, if you know these kids' stories, uh, you can give them a lot more leeway. Uh, some of their stories are horrendous. Um, <laughs> Uh, they've shared a lot with me through the years. And uh, yeah, <laughs> wow. Like anybody, I'm well aware of fentanyl, right? And that's my fear. And I said to him, come on, let's go to the hospital. I want to see what's in your blood. You know, if I'm going to have you home all night, I need to get some sleep. So let's just go up to emergency and uh, get your blood done so mommy can sleep. And he's like, okay. You know, it's not a bad kid. Okay, mom, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I'm so screwed up. I'm sorry I do this to you, mom. It's okay. Come on, buddy. There for a couple hours and he's passed out, obviously. And they're doing a shift change. And the nurse is telling the oncoming nurse, what's going on, she's updating everybody. You know, there's this person, there's this person, there's this person, and then she points over. She goes, and then there's Xanax boy over there. And I walked over to her. And I said, his name is Charles. He was born October 10th, 2000. 
He was a happy, healthy little boy. He is my child. He played baseball. He did singing, dancing, and acting. He loves his cats. He loves his family. He is a person. Sorry. My kid is dying. And I've got these people at Vanguard. Patrick and Mindy just kept reinforcing two things. You need to trust us. And the relationship between you and your son is what will keep your son safe. And I couldn't see it. I couldn't see what they were talking about. I thought, my relationship with my son, like, it's a teenager, it's a nightmare. And they said, no, he loves you. We see it. Trust us. Do you trust us? Yes, I trust you. I trust you. Trust is really tough in this position. It's tough when you're an elected official. It's tough when you're a single mother. It's tough to let people see. But I, I had no choice because nobody else was helping. We've been so busy that we're forgetting about relationships. We're so busy that we're forgetting about the basic connections that kids need. And we're assuming that a single family home would be able to do the same things that, that families used to be able to do. You know, our economies don't allow us to, to have a, a community of people around a child anymore. You know, Aboriginal culture has got so many things right. The transition into adulthood was about relationships with the elders. You know, my parents were survivors of residential school, both parents. My dad went to residential school. My mom went to residential school. They were both physically, emotionally, sexually abused, both of them. And as I share with the kids, you know, that, that, that was a hard place to be. I always think of my parents and I, and I, and I don't blame them for the upbringing that I was, because they did the best they could. And I always share with the kids here when we do First Nations here, you know, how do you love? You're taught how to love. So if you're not loved as a kid, how are you going to learn to love somebody when you have a kid? Because these kids have not been listened to for so long, all they do is bottle stuff up inside of them and hold it and hold it and hold it. And that was the one thing I can tell them is, you know what, I was the same. So I listen, and that's all these kids need. And that's why I love this school too, because a lot of the support workers are like that. They're here for the kids. They're here to listen to their stories. I just, my, like, one of, like, my only memories from when I was a kid, and it's, like, clear as day as I'm sitting on my aunt's lap eating this chocolate bar because the cops were at the house because my dad was trying to break in. And it, I didn't know what was going on at the time. I just wanted to let my dad in. I just wanted to see my dad, right? And I didn't know that he was trying to come in there to hurt my mom. And she was screaming at me not to unlock the door. And I was trying to, and I, I didn't know. And it was, it wasn't fun. It was kind of shitty. We noticed that kids were disclosing and were sharing things. And we're like, I haven't shared this before. And it wasn't that they were holding it in. It was more about nobody ever asked them. Now, growing up, I was a... Uh single child with my mom. My dad was not a good guy. He was very abusive. I was 11 when my parents got divorced and I just wanted the two people that I looked up to to like realize that they were a team, you know? They weren't supposed to be against each other. I'm really sorry. Um, people don't ever say that. I'm sorry that happened to you. And I wish I could change it, but I can't. But what can we do now? When you have a bad day, you'd go to cutting to make you feel better, to, to distract you from your emotional pain. You'd give yourself some physical pain, and it made you feel better. When my parents first found out about the self-harm, I kind of almost wanted them to leave me alone because I didn't want them to see me so broken because they were always so great to me, and I didn't want to hurt them. 
and that's why I kept it a secret for so long. I didn't want them to know that I was hurting myself or that I was hurting at all. What I don't want you to know about me is that I'm transgender. I'm different from everyone. I came out as gay in the fourth grade, and then in seventh grade, near the end, I came out as transgender. The most hate I got from was my dad at first because he was straight homophobic. What I usually don't want people to know about me is that I suffer from depression and anxiety. And sometimes, usually at night, um, I have suicidal thoughts. I was bullied a lot. Uh, school is a house of bullies. They try to stop it, but the groups just grow. What I don't want you to know about me is that I was sexually abused when I was five, and it makes it hard for me to develop interpersonal relationships with the people around me. And along with being able to function every day. What I don't want people to know about me is that I'm not confident and I'm not put together, and I'm really scared of a lot of stuff. Hurt people hurt people. So if you can help someone heal, wouldn't it be cool if healed people could heal people? Uh, at night, we have to do a walk around to check the school, make sure everything's locked up. Uh, I don't know how many times I came across kids hiding in a cubby hole by the school. And I always asked them, I says, what are you doing? And they said, this is the one place I felt safe. Safety is so critical because we have to literally pr protect them from their environment for a while. We have to protect them from the languages being used by the education system, by their peers. We need to give them a safe place for five, six hours a day that they can go, not hear the word skid, but also not hear the word learning disabled. You know, all those in connection with one another eventually give children an opportunity to just be who they want to be, which allows their natural nervous system to take charge, their natural skills and abilities to flourish. And then they start to see some positive um, successes and then suddenly holy cow look out when when we have our nervous systems going crazy you're as used to go right into fight mode you would put up your hands and go you decided early this year to not do the fighting anymore and to start transitioning what you perceive as aggressiveness in your past is is really assertiveness in your future the part that I really love the most about the neuroscience side is it, it you know, on the surface it looks like science and, and a bunch of jargon and all those kind of things, but the greatest side effects of that conversation is it stops talking about the label of the child. It's no longer about a bully. It's not no longer about a, a, a drug addict. It's about a child whose nervous systems are a little out of whack. And, and, it, and it, when you talk to the child and talk to the family, it's like, that's a label that we want to have them have. We want them to have a label going, okay, my body's a little bit out of whack. It can be rebalanced. I can do it. For myself personally, I go in their world because the only way to help them out is to get in it. Today we're planting some trees. Right now we're taking something that really can't survive on its own and we're trying to give it a good foundation. They're encased in this pot and they've grown into the shape of the pot and their roots are constrained. You have to spread those roots out and it looks terrible and like you're pulling them out of their comfort, but they need that or they'll not be able to survive in the wild. Would anyone feel comfortable just sitting in a circle and going around and maybe just sharing like what- I'd always felt 
like what I needed to do first was build relationships with the students. There's no way you're gonna learn your multiplication or your English essay writing skills if you're coming to a classroom where you don't feel like you can belong. And as the English teacher, I touch a lot of subjects that are controversial, a lot of topics that can be triggering for kids. And there's no way that they're gonna talk about topics of consent or drug use or anything that comes up in movies and characters and books that we read if they're struggling with that and they don't believe that I'm gonna understand them or I'm gonna place judgment on characters or people who have that kind of a life story. So I try really hard to have a classroom that has whatever the students need, stuff that's gonna get them. What is landing on my head? Me. You! That's David. Um, a student who I've been working really hard to get to know. You know, they're not bad kids. They just need somebody to listen and talk to. Lead them down a path. So if you have any feelings, you start feeling stuff, please don't just leave. Don't just get up and walk. Give a little sign, give a little look to somebody, one of the adults, let them know that you're in need. And then they can go for a walk with you. This is Vanguard. So this is family. They have a say in here, if somebody believes in you, you can do it. And around here, everybody believes in you. Everybody believes you can achieve, and the kids know it. So I'm coming. Now get that shit out of there. I just like to feel the weight of his body. Like, it, it's so solid, and um, it reminds me that he's getting so much better, and... I call Patrick the Orchid King. There used to be this superintendent of schools, and she really helped me with Charles. She said, okay, well, let's talk about your kid. And she met him, and we talked about him, and she said, well, he's an orchid kid. Orchid kids, they live at Vanguard. The orchid is a remarkable thing. People see it, and sometimes it's a stick. And a lot of people look at it and they think, this plant is dead, it's just a stick. But those people can't see what's really going on. An orchid is so smart and so resilient that when the conditions in the environment aren't perfect, the orchid goes dormant to sustain itself and to stay alive until it's put in the appropriate conditions where it can blossom and bloom and be the beautiful flower that it is. And those kids at Vanguard, people saw sticks. And along come Patrick and Mindy and Mitch and Dee. And they pick up these sticks, and Patrick creates with his team the perfect environment. And these little sticks turn into the most beautiful flowers you've ever seen. I'm excited. Time can tell. My dad, my dad's buying you um, one of the flower things you put in, you clip onto your suit. That's cute. I know. <laughs> Are you nervous? I'm freaking terrified. I'm excited, but I'm scared. You know, what got Cameron through this, honestly, was when he met Mindy in middle school, and she started steering him in the right direction and being an understanding person and actually listening to him instead of judging him. I tried my best to get out of there. I tried my best to ignore her. I tried my best to push her away. I didn't succeed. She didn't give up on me, which is what I think I needed in life. I mean, I had my mom, but I needed someone else, not only just one. These are some of the best, kindest, most beautiful people that I've ever met. Even the people that, you know, you think have done bad things or have gone through bad things or people who are, are kind of scary even. They're such 
beautiful souls. When I first started here, I was an asshole to all the teachers and all the staff. I don't know why they put up with me. I was a dick. You're worth it, you matter, and we want you to know the truth and not believe the lies. And that's why we do what we do, and that's why we appreciate and get that your trust is a gift. One of the most common questions I'm asked is, what type of student goes to Vanguard? You're not a flavor, you're not a color, you're not a type, you're not a label. The big vision to change the entire way the world educates kids, as insane as that sounds, why not try? I mean, what's the worst thing that happens? We fail, and that's, that's the model of our school. <laughs> if, you, if you try something and you fail, you actually learn great resiliency skills, and you learn how to cope and adapt, and, and you learn way more from failure than success. So, so that's what we're gonna role model, and, and from a leadership standpoint, myself and the senior leadership in this district, we're going for it. Love is not something that is a sort of rare commodity. Everybody has it. Existence is love. But uh, it's like water flowing through a hose. It depends in which direction you point it. Point it. Point it. Point it.